Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. En vos titres, rang et grade respectifs. Euh, malheureusement, on voit, ne voit pas votre caméra. Ok, on va activer. Ah, ok. Euh, en fait, c'est vous qui devez autoriser en réalité. C'est bon maintenant Voilà. Euh, vous nous entendez maintenant Ah oui. Euh, la on... caméra est Exactement. Tout est parfait. Juste une seule seconde. Je vais mettre ça en live pour que ceux qui veulent suivre de la distance puissent le faire. Donnez-moi juste une seule seconde pour activer. Vous en prie. Oui, tout, a, tout est OK, euh, Monsieur le ministre. Alors, merci bien. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous euh, en vos grades, rangs et titres respectifs. Euh, je voudrais juste dire que je suis Robert Kargoubou, je suis médecin de santé publique, je suis le ministre... Euh, de la santé et de l'hygiène publique du Burkina Faso. Je voudrais avant tout propos dire merci à African Institute of Business and Technology d'avoir permis la tenue de cette conférence sur une thématique d'actualité, en particulier dans le domaine de la santé. Nous aurons ainsi aujourd'hui l'honneur et le privilège d'écouter un conférencier sur l'intelligence artificielle appliquée au domaine pharmaceutique. J'ai nommé le docteur Enstock. Le docteur Peter Enstock est directeur et responsable de l'apprentissage automatique de l'intelligence artificielle chez Pfizer. Son travail se situe à l'intersection de l'intelligence artificielle, de la visualisation, des statistiques et du génie logiciel appliqué principalement à la découverte de médicaments, mais plus récemment aux essais cliniques. Docteur Peter Einstock euh, s'efforce de promouvoir la méthodologie de l'intelligence artificielle au sein de Pfizer afin d'améliorer la recherche et le développement des médicaments. Docteur Peter est titulaire d'un doctorat en intelligence artificielle de l'université Purdue. Il a été reconnu par le groupe Deep Knowledge Analytics comme l'un des douze principaux leaders mondiaux dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle et de l'industrie pharmaceutique. Docteur Peter est enseignant à l'Université de Harvard en intelligence artificielle et génie logiciel. Je voudrais donc vous inviter, nous inviter à suivre et à poser toutes les questions d'intérêt et que je vais modérer. Euh, je voudrais donc aussi euh, juste mentionner que vous pouvez euh, choisir l'icône pour la langue si vous voulez suivre le webinaire en français ou en anglais. Vous pouvez euh, 
cliquer sur l'icône euh, globe et choisir votre langue. Ceci étant, Dr. Peter, si vous êtes prêt, vous pouvez commencer. À vous. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's the first time I've had a, my talk translated, and I apologize. My, I haven't studied French for many years, and it's very rusty. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about different projects and ways of thinking that we have about how artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used within the pharmaceutical industry. I have lots of slides and I probably won't go through all of them, but I hope to give you an idea of what kinds of projects we are looking at, what kinds of ideas and, and thoughts that we have. And at the end, I'll probably talk about some of the challenges we also have in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning within the pharma space. So kind of where are we? Um, pharma really needs this construction of knowledge. And there's a, a famous person, Pedro Domingos from the University of Washington, who has this uh, idea of the five tribes of machine learning. He says, in order to con construct knowledge, we actually have it built into our DNA. A bird doesn't have to learn how to build a nest, it just knows how to do it. And we have some skills that are come from us from our DNA. We have cultural aspects, which are passed on from generation to generation and society norms. We have our own knowledge, our own training experience that brings us ideas and, and how to put them together. But all these things are on different time scales. And as the literature is arriving faster and faster these days, we rely more and more on artificial intelligence to extract the information for us, put it together in interesting ways so that we can construct knowledge, which is what we are after in the pharmaceutical space. We've seen artificial intelligence have wonderful successes for different problems. This is the famous ImageNet competition that ran for several years. The error rates were around 30% and dropped in, by 2016 below 5%. And they were roughly as good as humans in being able to recognize objects and images with some caveats. We've seen similarly in being able to listen uh, the phone speech word error rates, being able to listen to a single word on a phone channel, um, started again with high error rates of 16% and again dropped um, with Microsoft being the first one to break the, the human level and get a better uh, performance than humans could in recognizing individual words. Of course, we've also seen AI play games and come up with solutions for not only tic-tac-toe, but checkers chess and even go um, some very large search spaces and some challenging problems that I, I honestly never thought they would be able to master and conquer but google did this in 2016 and of course ibm had big blue which beat the grandmaster in chess a few years before that so we've seen ai kind of come and go throughout the last 60 or 70 years we had the initial kickoff in 1958 with the dartmouth kickoff of a AI where they actually used the word artificial intelligence for the first time. It had a great momentum, but then it failed because it couldn't succeed in translating language, for instance. And so this book in 1969 started what they called the AI winter, where there was no funding, no research going on for many years. It came back again in the 1980s with backpropagation for neural networks and the concept of expert systems, that you could take a person's knowledge, encode it in a computer, and develop a rule system, and that would work pretty well. The problem is that rule-based systems are very good when you can construct them, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to construct a very good rule system. And so again, we had an AI winter that followed for another 20 years or so with very little funding, very little research going on. What we've seen since then is really deep learning has kind of transformed our world. I have deep learning that's now on my phone. It's not going away anymore. And this really kicked off with AlexNet in the competition in 2012, recognizing objects. And so because there's so many images sitting around in the web these days, they were able to use that and put them together in an intelligent way with a convolutional neural network. And so image understanding and recognition of objects was really the first area that took off um, in our more recent era. 
And so the reason it took off is that people were able to take these different images and run them together. Maybe it's cats, maybe it's dogs. Everyone puts their pets on the, on the web. You can train up a system very easily on this kind of data set. And because it's a sequential learning with deep learning, you don't have to store it all in memory at the same time. And that was very important at the time, but with systems keep evolving and they get better and better. And this has become an easy classification system. So easy that I give this problem to my students who can solve it in a week. But the new thing is that we can do transfer learning where we can train on cats and dogs, but then take that pre-trained network and then apply it to cell-based images and fine tune it on those. And this course training on the cats and dogs allows us to get a better result with less data on our fine tuned results. And so we were able to get much better results for all sorts of imaging things based on this concept of transfer learning, which was fairly straightforward. And so a, a sample problem we've been looking at is histology data. These are slices of tissue that you can put on a slide that people take a high resolution picture of these and the images are about 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So it's a very large image compared to my normal camera on my, my phone. Um, but we need an expert pathologist, a disease expert, who can read this and say, is there anything normal or abnormal in this? Uh, perhaps it's an animal has been given a, a particular drug and they want to know if there's any side effects of that drug in the tissues. And so we can look at different kinds of tissues, look at different resolutions, but it takes five to 10 minutes for a pathologist to say yes or no. There's something normal or abnormal about this one picture. It's a small training set, but using this transfer learning idea, we were able to get fairly good results um, with only about a thousand images. And so we have one label per image and we're able to identify not only whether or not this image has something wrong, but identify the particular location as to where it might be wrong. So this is a very good use case that allows us to speed up our processes and help the pathologist identify um, whether or not this is a, a abnormal or, or normal tissue. Another place we've been able to use this is in the crystal classification problem. If we have a protein that we are interested in creating a drug for, the protein has a three-dimensional structure. It looks like a particular shape, but we don't know what shape it is. And if we knew, we could find a drug that binds in exactly the right way and optimize that drug. But um, since we don't have that, we have to create a, a crystal structure and if we can do that, then we can blast it with x-rays and identify this 3D structure. And so the limiting step of this process is actually not doing the creating the crystals, but it's actually in looking at the crystals and figuring out, is there crystals there? Is it clear? Is there some kind of a precipitate in it? Or is there some other noise, perhaps a hair or some other thing that we don't understand? And so it's a four class classification problem. And we've been able to get around 90% accuracy uh, using deep learning with pre-trained networks. And it's worked quite well. Um, I think the limitation at this point is that some of our truth data labeled by humans is actually not accurate. So I think we'll probably have to have a couple more loops through the data, working with people to verify that our particular classifications are correct and verify that the training data is also correct. But this is also a, a nice promising area that we're looking at. Of course, there's many other imaging problems that are more detailed, but I won't go further on those today. The opportunity that I, I think that the image processing allows is this, based on this paper from Nature Methods a couple of years ago. And they basically said that it's not so much that we can recognize things and analyze images using deep learning, but it's transforming the analysis and interpretation of the data. It's making difficult analyses routine and enabling researchers to carry out previously impossible experiments. Before we could have many different dyes, many different scenarios, different locations, but we couldn't, we didn't have enough analysis power to be able to unravel the results. And with deep learning, we can now go further and do much more with the data. And so it's opening up all sorts of new opportunities in terms of more complicated experiments and richer sets of data. And this is kind of an exciting time for the overall field of cellular image analyses, which has a lot of promise for identifying new drugs. So that was the image processing. 
where we are right now, I think, is really the, the great time for natural language processing. And so the images came first because people knew how to take collections of images and apply them together with the transfer learning. But it took several years for them to figure out how to apply it to the deep learning problem. And we had this famous technique from Google in 2013 called the word to vec, which transforms a word into a vector. And a vector is just a series of numbers. And that's very important because if we have a vector for a word, we can compare mathematically how similar it is to other words. And based on the context of the words around it, we can identify which words might fit in that context, how similar they are, and we're solving both the grammar and the semantics, the meaning of the words. However, the problems with word to vec is that it looks at every single word and produces one vector. But if they had the word LEAD, it could mean lead, it could mean the word lead, which is the element, or it could mean something else. And so there's multiple meanings and word to vec couldn't untangle those. And so it wasn't until 2018, we have a new class of models, again from Google, called the BERT models. And these are allowing us to understand every word and how it relates to the other words. Um, and so BERT is uh, trained on 110 million, or, sorry, it has 340 million parameters. It's a massive training set. We has different versions that are trained on clinical trials in PubMed. PubMed is a source of about 30 million abstracts within the medical literature or biomedical literature. And they trained it up for many days on lots of uh, processor power. It costs a lot of money for them to train it. But we can take these models and apply them and tune them for our particular problems in the natural language processing space of our industry. And so a lot of this technology has come by this idea of a transformer architecture. It's this idea that we could create a deep learning network before, which looks like a tree or a Christmas tree, perhaps. But now for language, we need some kind of a sequential model. We have a series of nodes that are stretched out and they learn not only from the new words that are coming in, but also from the previous words that were entered. And so it's a sequence of words is the model. And they've replaced the, the building blocks of that sequence with this very complicated architecture, which has lots of different nodes and pieces of how mathematical transformations are going on within this thing called the transformer using this model of um, attention and putting it all together they can make very good predictions on how it all works and what word should be next what is the function of every single word and so if i have the sentence the animal didn't cross the street because it was tired the attention architecture allows us to understand what the word it refers to. It's not tired, it's not the street, um, it's the animal. And, and so this has solved a, a 50, 75 year old problem of called reference or anaphora, be able to understand what this word refers to and it's been solved. Overall, AI has lots of opportunities um, in the pharma R&D pipeline. We divide the pipeline into drug research, which is trying to figure out what drug might be good. And then the drug development is the clinical trials. And I'm gonna talk through several different aspects of this uh, today, talk about some literature mining, some patents, clinical trial submissions, and uh, maybe some drug labels. We'll see what we have time for. But there's dozens of opportunities, if not hundreds or thousands of opportunities of different problems that exist in the space that can be enhanced through artificial intelligence techniques. And so we're trying as a company and an industry to figure out where the best opportunities are. There's nothing that stands up and says, this is clearly an AI problem. And we're dealing with a lot of challenges in this space because people don't understand what AI can do. There's a lot of learning and training that has to go on at all levels of the industry to understand what the opportunities are, where AI can fit best. And that's a, a challenge for, I think, most industries that are transitioning. So the first project I'm going to talk about is one done by uh, some of my students at Harvard Extension School on drug labels. And the question is, can drug labels be used to understand drug patents? So it's an interesting problem. Um, so the idea behind this is that we have a series of patents that have been associated with a particular drug. So we might think about uh, 
well, your favorite drug. And the first time there's a patent, it was before the clinical trial started. And then they patented a second one based upon the process. And then there was a manufacturing one and several other ones. And there's usually many different patents associated with one drug. Drug labels are another aspect. The, our government, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, has laws as to many countries as to what information has to be provided with a drug. And so there's a drug label that comes out. They get a greater understanding of it as more patients take it, and uh, they make revisions to it. In fact, there's revisions almost every few months to drug labels in one way or another. And it's important to get these things right, but there's a sequence of them over time. The question that this project posed is, is it possible to use this information about the drug labels to figure out which are the important patents for the science of the drug? They're all important legally, but some are more important than others because some of the drug label changes came about as a result of a change of the patent. And so if we can figure out which one came back to it, which change of a drug label is responsible for which of the uh, patent or derivations, then we have a better understanding and insight on the key patents. So how do we do that? There's this thing called the Orange Book um, in the United States, which has a list of all these small molecule chemical drugs uh, that are in, and it also has all the patents that are associated with them. The drug labels are available on the FDA site, and there's also the United States Patent Office, which has all our patents. So we took these pieces of information and we extracted all the patents for all the drugs. And we also took all the claims from every patent. We used the drug names to look up the FDA drug labels, and we looked at it as a function of time. So every change to a drug label, we extracted that drug label change. We put them together and tried to match the patent claims against the changes of the drug label. And we made a nice user interface for that. And so the idea is that we could visualize how a drug label changes over time. We could match it against the patent claims, and then we can export it for different kinds of analyses. These were our three requirements. So here's what the system looks like. It's called PharmaDB, and it's available online at pharmadb.org. And you type in a particular drug, which I realize is very small, but it says epinephrine, and there's different choices. We can select one of these. And here's our epinephrine drug. Here is the time of the labels. And so it started back in 2015 with the first label, several changes in 2016, sorry, 2000, so you have 2017, 20, and so on. So these lollipops are new versions of the drug label. The text here is shown in red or green. It shows that things have been added or removed from the drug label. And so we're tracking all these changes and displaying them for the end user. On the right side, every change that's occurred is associated and scored against a particular patent claim. And so here's a patent 1000004700. Claim number two has an 86% match against this particular claim. And uh, this one has a 63% match and so on. And uh, so we can actually look at the individual text, the changes between a couple patents, and find out which patents are most associated with that particular change. So it's an interesting problem, actually, because we're trying to equate um, we're trying to equate the description in the medical space with the patents in the legal space. So that was one of the challenges. So let's talk about how we did it. So we downloaded and stored the different components that I talked about earlier, and these are refreshed every few days. We're extracting all the information and storing the text and identifying the different drug label changes. We apply machine learning and have a web interface on the front end. So I'll just skip all that. And um, so here's the challenge. How do we take this one change of a drug label, which is very technical in the medical space, and one claim from a patent and uh, looking at this from the other space in the legal context. They're quite different, uh, but how do we figure out if they're the same thing? And so the approach we took was to create a vector for each of these separate entities. 
And then we can compare the cosine angle between these two vectors in this high dimensional space. And this would be our measure of similarity. If this angle is small, then it's, they're very similar. If it's large, then they're not. A challenge of this is that we don't have any training data. And so we tried lots of different approaches, um, different versions of BERT, as you see, and other techniques. And uh, to figure out how to do it, because we have no training data, we took a random set of drug labels and a random set of unrelated patents and just created a distribution. We then took a set of relevant ones that we knew would be were closely related to that particular drug label and created a new distribution. And we looked to see which produced the largest shift from shouldn't be a shouldn't be a good set of matches to what should be. And the one that had the largest shift was the best method. And this turned out to be this MPNet neural network approach, uh, which worked quite well. And so using this technique, we were able to match all the drug changes to the different lab the different claims. We can show the matches and claims, and we actually can get an insight as to how different companies patent their drugs from this. Which, uh, and so it proved to be a successful and, and interesting project. All right, um, another project um, which we worked on was called Clinical Trial Frontiers. Clinical trials are where we test a particular drug and all this information in the US is put into clinicaltrials.gov. It's a government sponsored website that has all sorts of information about the clinical trials. And so you can type in here, it looks like this. You can type in your particular disease and look for all the trials that are recruiting or have completed or other information. But one thing we like to do is get information on our particular drug. And we're thinking about looking at Alzheimer's. What is the current state of the Alzheimer clinical trials? How many trials are there? Who's competing? What are the different reviews? Um, what phases are they in? Are they successful or not? If we look for clinical trials, this is all the graphics they get. It says, well, there are some trials running. It doesn't break them down by disease. We don't know who's doing them. There's not very interesting graphics. So can we get that insight more readily by doing something else? And so we thought we could mine the clinicaltrials.gov, create some new visualizations and, and put all the information together more readily for the scientists. And so this is what they put together. It's a, a more complicated interface because it's for a different audience. It's for people who are looking at this on a daily basis and they wanna have lots of different fields, including the routes of administration, uh, the modality of it, and additional information that normal people would not want to ask for. And so they can type in atopic dermatitis, looking for a severe, and come back with a series of results for atopic dermatitis. And so it shows all the trials, and these are all the drug trials. These are other kinds of observational studies. Here's a table of all the different studies, uh, which shows the, the title, the condition, the intervention, sponsor, phase, and, and so on. It's sortable, it's filterable. Um, we have uh, additional information. We can figure out who the leaders are. So Regeneron Corporation has 30 different patents in this, or 30 different trials going on. Um, LEO Pharma has 28 uh, and so on. And we can look at the different phases and the status of the files of the trials. Here it says there's a lot of phase two trials, some phase three. Uh, most are still enrolling, and so it's still early days. And we get a lot of information up front very quickly. We can also look at uh, timelines that are associated with the phase. And so we can see, well, which trials are going on and are they in a phase one, phase two, phase three, or we just don't know. So a lot of information provided very quickly that can be tapped into uh, PowerPoint slides and give an analysis up to date fairly quickly. We can also export these results uh, by JSON or, or CSV files. And I'll skip the technical details, but goes behind it. What we're now working on is how to map the different endpoints and outcomes against each other. And so we can relate one trial studies they're studying the UPDRS. Another one says they're studying the universal Parkinson's disease. Um, I can't remember the RS, 
but all these different versions of the same clinical trial outcomes are written in text and can't be aligned very easily. And so if you're doing some kind of a meta-analysis across trials, you have to do this manually. We're also looking at the different inclusion, exclusion criteria and the implications of those things. So a lot of different projects are underway currently in this space. Another project we're looking at is trying to predict which drug diseases or sorry, protein uh, diseases are likely to make it into a clinical trial. I mean, it's an interesting problem. Can you predict which diseases and targets might make it? And the problem was, can we predict what will happen in a phase two trial in five years from now? So what they did is they said, well, let's look at the trends of literature. And this is just Google Trends, but we can see deep learning is going, um, has increased quite a bit from 2010 to 2019. CNNs, convolutional neural networks, and natural language processing keep getting better. We've been looking at trends across different articles and industries by what fraction of the articles are about artificial intelligence. But these are the ideas. If we can look at these trends, maybe we can understand from the what's being published, which ones might be an interesting large target. And so they mined PubMed, which has the 30 million abstracts. We mined the clinicaltrials.gov collection. And here's our goal, which ones will reach a phase two trial five years from now. And so the students created a, a beautiful interface. This is looking at the trends of a particular target over time about how many publications are focused on this target. On the lower left, we have the number of publications on the particular disease. And here we have both of them together with a list of all the different citations broken out. And so we can see from 2006 or seven, there's been a, a strong trend towards a lot more publications, but it seems to have been dropping off. So we can do this across all the different disease areas and train up a model that not only makes this nice plot, but predicts which ones will uh, make it in five years. So they mined all this data, extracted it, trained up some machine learning models and came up with a prediction. And uh, slides would be cut off, but the results are a reasonably impressive 71% area under the rock curve. So this is the area that we shoot for. It'd be perfect it was up in here, but as you can see, it's going fairly far north of an average result. And so this is a, a reasonably good prediction. It was based on XG boost, as I recall. No, sorry, it's gradient boosting classification gave us the best result. We tried different combinations of neural networks, gradient boosting, XG boost, random forest, and other approaches, but this one was the best. What's also interesting is that we looked at the feature importance and the number of citations for an article was the most important indication. So if someone says this particular disease is associated with this target and that gets many citations in the future, well, that's a good indication that um, it's a very predictive measure of whether or not it's going to make a clinical trial. The other aspects were the importance of the journal paper. If it's a nature or science journal, it gets a higher rating and therefore it should be upweighted, whereas other metadata was uh, less important. And it's a complicated workflow. I will skip over the architecture details. But uh, it was able to make reasonably good predictions just based upon the literature of the PubMed abstracts. And uh, so without any insight, knowledge, or anything else, a 71% accuracy is, is pretty good um, in terms of being able to predict these kinds of things. On in the interest of time, I think I'll skip through this one very quickly, but the idea is, can we mine patent space? And can we identify the epitopes from patents? So an epitope is where on a particular target an antibody might bind in a way that will block the creation or block that particular pathway associated with that target. So if all the targets are chain reactions in our body, can we block that chain reaction by putting an antibody in some place that a compound might buy, bind or somehow change it? And antibodies are very specific to a particular location on the particular target. And so what this does is it mines all the different sequences for that target. 
and extracts all the claimed epitopes and visualizes them together on different patents for uh, a particular disease area. So I, yeah. Um, so it's an extraction of a lot of information and claim data from patents that are the result of a search um, that someone else has previously done. So you take a series of patents on some particular target, it goes through them all, extracts all the sequences, and puts them together in a visual idea. And what this view shows is who's got what patent, what claims are available, what space is able to go after uh, without any legal implications. And it's a nice visualization on that. So I've had several projects that have been focused on natural language processing. I think we're, we still have quite a few to go uh, because it's a rich area. There's a lot of science being produced and the reports are all in natural language and as opposed to databases. But the combination of the natural language understanding with this data um, enriches the overall process. And so currently there's a lot of things we can do quite well with natural language processing. We can search, extract, identify new words, classify documents. We're pretty good at being able to distinguish the different uh, word senses. And I mentioned this idea of reference, being able to identify pronouns and what they relate to. Translation is quite good these days. And summarization is, uh, is getting very close to being quite useful. It's not quite there, I don't think, but I have so many papers I need to read every day. Could they be summarized so I can read fewer of them? Is a great opportunity. We still not perfect about grammar aware data extraction. We're looking at those kinds of problems. And automatic writing of documents is something that we are also exploring of how to automatically write up a protocol or analysis um, plan for different clinical trials. We can't do context aware language and we're still have a ways to go in terms of other linguistics aspects, but it's all quite a uh, positive direction. The reason these things I think are, are so important is because of these ideas of knowledge graphs. It's the idea that we can't understand the science well enough because it keeps changing so quickly. And so can we extract the relevant pieces of information and put them together in some kind of a graph structure that can be used by both machines and people? And this is the strategic direction that I think most pharma companies are, are heading down these ways. The idea is we can take some kind of a SNP and say it modifies a particular gene. Now, there's some kind of a relationship of that SNP to a gene. That gene upregulates another gene, which is associated with some kind of a disease. And there's drugs that inhibit certain genes and other things. They have side effects. And all these relationships can be extracted from text using natural language processing. So let me talk a little bit more about the knowledge graph and what we're thinking about those. A very general question is, how do we learn? Um, some people take notes when they're writing. Um, some people highlight. Some people take notes on the computer. How you learn is rather personal, but we all have some way of some crutch of extracting the core pieces that we need to know, whether it's for our own knowledge or for a test. And if we have that knowledge, how do we represent it? And how do computers represent it? The answer for many years has been databases for computers and text for humans. But neither of these things is quite right. What we're finding is that connected data is really a great source of knowledge and insight. Everything is connected to everything else. In fact, there's a book called Linked um, that describes exactly and motivates this idea that everything is connected. And if everything is connected, you don't want to have these stray pieces of information, but you want to basically connect different pieces of information together. And this is where knowledge and insight come from. And so it's quite a compelling case and an, an easy read book by a, a uh, expert in the area. So if we think about search in a graph, uh, if we make the, for the tic-tac-toe game, artificial intelligence has been doing this kind of problem for decades. There's different solutions, but the solution is actually a graph. It's navigating different paths through a graph structure, which happens to be a hierarchy. If you think about chemistry, this is also a graph because we are taking different components, synthesizing things through different reactions, 
and making molecules. And of course, biology is a graph also because there's interactions and chain reactions and pathways that go on in all systems. And we're still trying to understand all these different connections, but we understand them for different pieces of um, the process and are trying to predict additional processes. So if all these things are graphs, and even the way we think, um, there's a very popular software called MindMapper that allows you to kind of brainstorm. And instead of creating a list, it creates a, a graph structure, a tree, where you can break things down into new ideas and go in different directions. So all these ways of thinking are essentially a graph. It's problem solving games, um, taking notes and representing information can be done with this idea of a, gra a knowledge graph. And it draws from a couple ideas. One is graph database technology. Another one is the semantic web technology. Let me talk about those and start with the graph database. So normally for data and machine learning, we like to have tables that look like this. I get one of these tables almost every day, usually much bigger. And this is how we've been thinking about data for many years. This is also stored in a database, a relational database. And if we want to join different pieces of information, we, we can do it. In fact, there's an operation called a join for relational databases like Oracle's and uh, MySQL and, and Postgres. And this is a very standard operation. If I apply it to some problems, it becomes very difficult. For instance, if I say, who is the friend of my friend? Well, I have to do a search and a join of me against everyone to figure out who my friends are. And then for each of those, I have to do another join against all these things. And if you are Facebook, which has a hundred million or a billion different people in it, that's a lot of computation and it has to be done multiple times. So it's not very efficient for solving some kinds of problems. And so instead, people are just turning towards graphs. Graphs are simply nodes that are connected by an edge. And uh, we could say, well, a node could have different types. So there's a person and there's a, a company perhaps. And this edge can also have some kind of relationship such as works at. And so I'm putting a value into the node, the, the person type of node, a value into the company type of node and have a, a type of relationship, all of which can be governed by rules and schema. And I can attend a, a conference and I can include other information on the node, such as how large is Pfizer. So this is becoming more and more complicated, but we're adding additional details into the different pieces. And it has a standard format. So it's called the subject project object format. And if I start putting these things together, just the structure alone allows me to have insight. So this is a famous picture um, from a paper that says, well, these are Florentine marriages in during the Renaissance. And so if we look at this graph closely, I don't know anything about the Renaissance or Florence, but I can see just from the structure that the Medicis are the most influential people in this entire graph. They must have a lot of daughters that they've married off to different people, but the structure alone from the graph gives me insight. This is without doing anything else, just storing the data and looking at it provides insight. And so people have been putting all sorts of information into these graph networks. There's Uber for taxis, Facebook, dating, cell phone networks, and lots of other things. There's biological things, recommenders, and everything is moving towards graph these days. And there's lots of different graph databases that exist. Neo4j is one of the largest and most famous, but Amazon has their Neptune, and there's many other versions of these. Um, and so if we go towards the knowledge graph rather than just a graph database, it draws upon this idea of the semantic web technologies or something equivalent. There's different approaches to it, but the semantic web was a, a technology from about 10 years ago that never really took off. It's still kind of waiting to have its uh, prime time. But the idea is that you can connect things in different ways and there's rules for connecting things. 
this is very similar to the graph idea. And you can specify what relationships are allowed. And so I can attend a school, I can work at a company, but I don't work at a conference. For instance, I don't I attend a conference. And I can also have rules for the hierarchy and, and formally specifying the different relationships. An example is the gene ontology or the, the medical subject headings or mesh that says, oh yes, there's diseases, there's lung diseases, there's respiratory lung diseases, there's cancerous lung diseases, and, and so on. There's a, a standard hierarchy that can be detailed. And so when you do a search for data, you can specify what level you want to dial into. And so here's some examples of adverse events ontology. And here's for migraine disorders, a the mesh medical subject headings idea, all of which are standardized and can be included in any search or extraction. And I'll just skip ahead. And all right. So as we start to put these things together, we are putting together lots and lots of information, We're putting together billions of entries from the different medical literature, from our databases, and Google has a massive uh, massive storage of a billion entries or so for their knowledge graph that allows them to answer questions better than their original search engine. In fact, it, they've replaced their search engine with the knowledge graphs backing behind it. But most of the pharma companies are now headed to the same idea to store their data and the different relationships that we have within it. And so it provides a way not only for people to think about different hypotheses, but also allows us to have a, apply machine learning and AI to the graph structure instead. And so this dual interpretable ability by humans and computers is quite powerful. And um, there's this thing called the hype cycle from Gartner. The most recent one says that knowledge graphs are at the most hype, but I still think there's a lot more opportunity for them. The hype cycle goes and says, well, things get overhyped and then they, they don't meet their expectations, but then in the longer term, they start really having a lot of potential. So I think we're still working towards this longer term potential, but it's an interesting time for this technology right now. And a lot of companies are heavily invested in, in going after these knowledge graphs. So I've kind of motivated the idea. Um, and let me just talk about the machine learning and what's available. So there's some, uh, if people construct these kinds of knowledge graphs, they can do different things with them. And this is one example where they're looking for different strategies of repurposing a drug and just using the graph in some simple network analysis, they can figure out the relationship of diseases and drugs and identify some interesting relationships to repurpose. Um, another one that's put their data in a knowledge graph is this disease gene relationships network um, that was specified in this paper by uh, Soran Tadin in 2018. And so they're using different kinds of visualizations on top of the graph, but relating the diseases and genes. Another one's for repurposing, and this one's shown for a, a drug and nicotine dependence, looking at the different approaches and, and groups and how they're all related, the different targets. A fantastic one that includes lots of different information is HEAD.io, and it just includes information on the genes, diseases, compounds, pharmacological classes, and lots of other aspects that we can use publicly. It's uh, publicly available, it's available for free on the web, and uh, a great resource for getting started in knowledge graphs. But let me just motivate briefly the idea of you know, the machine learning approach for it. The, I mentioned earlier that most machine learning is based on tables of data. So statistics and machine learning like this structure of data. But of course, for the graphs, we don't have that. What we'd like to do is to convert some kind of a graph structure or subgraph into some representation of numbers that we can then apply the machine learning to. But how do we do that? Well, one thing we could do is we can just take the individual nodes and the different data associated with them and create a table. 
that works, but it's fairly limited. It's missing the relationships, which are one of the key aspects. So we can all, always include the connections to the neighbors. These are just individual pieces and can be represented in a matrix format. So we have these two pieces, but we can do better than both of those things by using an embedding approach. And an embedding is taking the local relationships that we have in all the different graphs and mapping those down into a smaller dimensional um, space with a numeric representation. And so what this does is not only captures the, the nodes that we had before, the edges we had before, but the different kinds of relationships as they appear are captured more completely. And so we are automatically including the context or the local regions within this embedding process and allows us to make better models than we could with either just the edges or the nodes themselves. And so there's a lot of power in being able to do this. And what we can do with that information is to do link prediction. We can say there's a, a set of different drugs that are available. Let's make a link prediction as to which would be the best candidate to solve the uh, COVID-19, for instance. And one of the successful outcomes from the COVID was that a company called Benevolent AI used their knowledge graph in about four hours to predict one drug that made it into a clinical trial to treat the cytokine storm associated with COVID. They just ran their algorithm and tried to make the prediction of a link connecting different drugs to the COVID cytokine storm. And it's in clinical trials. I, I don't know what the outcome is, but it was quite successful in being able to recognize this as a potential candidate. All right, I'm gonna skip through that. All right, I'm running low on time. Uh, let, me, let me just talk about the opportunity for wearable sensors. Uh, what we're seeing now is really, we've gone through the language, we've gone through different ways of using NLP. The trend I see now is that the pharma industry and medicine in general have started picking up their own applications and, and focusing on their own problems. And so it's a really exciting time for machine learning and AI to start working on pharma problems, not generalizing other problems, but actually focusing on just the pharma problems and healthcare AI. And so wearable sensors is one of these spaces that's becoming critical. We're starting to see there's 348 trials with wearable sensors right now. Some are in phase one, phase two, phase four. There's been 100 uh, completed, 108 going on. And so they're being used for things that can be measured easily, such as um, cardiovascular, Parkinson's, and, and many other cases. I'll talk briefly about a, a Parkinson's use case with the wearable sensors and our experience with it. But um, so Parkinson's is associated with a, a tremor. And so there's a, a shaking of your hand, perhaps, as um, and there's also a slowed movement. There's balance issues and other things. And so these are observable and can be measured using a wearable sensor. Uh, and so we've been exploring the use of wearable sensors to capture our disease understanding and leverage it for clinical trials. The disease of Parkinson's has lots of different symptoms associated with it. In fact, there's a thing called the universal UPDRS, Universal Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, that characterizes it. And the way it works is that you go into the clinic, uh, you run through a series of experiments with a clinician. You tap your fingers as many times as you can in 30 seconds. You touch your nose and other things. It's not a test for drunkenness, but it's a test for Parkinson's. You stand up, you sit down, you walk 10 steps, turn around and come back. And after an hour, they give you a rating of a a 2.5. You then take your medicine that they're evaluating, wait for it to work, and repeat the entire process for another hour. And so after two and a half hours, you get one number. In order to figure out whether or not it's significant, you'd have to have thousands of patients performing these clinical trials. What if you had some kind of a wearable sensor that could detect your movement 24 hours a day, you'd be able to figure out 
how long the drug lasts, when is it most effective, does it affect your actions, and many other things. And so we explored three different positions for sensors on your body. These are basically strapped and they're about this big. And they measure accelerometer in three different directions, as well as a gyroscope in three different directions. And they sample about at 40 hertz or 40 hertz, 40 times per second. And so we get different kind of data that looks like this. It's called the actigraphy data. And we have different motion when they are walking or doing different activities in different directions. So the question is, can we determine who has Parkinson's versus who has who is healthy from looking at these kinds of timelines using different criteria? And we see subtle differences when they're standing or sitting, larger differences when they're walking or, or holding something perhaps. And so we tried an experiment for a couple of weeks. We got some ground truth and asked them at different time points which activities they were doing and came up with some results that look like this. So we used the sensor software to figure out when they were walking or when they were sitting and so on. And so it gives us a guideline as to what periods of time they are sitting, standing, or walking or sleeping. And what we found is that the sensor was quite accurate for, in some cases, but for the walking, it was designed for healthy people. And the, the, the walking gait is so different for Parkinson's that they couldn't recognize walking because it's a, a very different tempo, it's a different gait, different distance. And so we ended up going back to the original uh, data, the raw data that is, extracted the different time courses and, and figured out when someone was walking. We did some basic analyses, but we ended up using machine learning approach to extract the periods when they were walking and then extract different features using the time series from that and trained up a classifier for healthy or perhaps Parkinson's patients. And then using that, we could figure out with roughly one second of data, we could figure out with 80% accuracy whether or not a person was on their medicine or off their medicine. Just one second of data. So it, it proved quite powerful. And I think that wearable sensors will be even more important in the future as they give us more insight into the nature of disease. I'm just skipping ahead in the interest of time. Um, so I think I'm about out of time. So I'll talk about one more project and then we'll kind of talk about some of the challenges of artificial intelligence. This one is called Clin Twin 360 by another group of students. And the idea is, can we improve our recruitment of patients for clinical trials? So patient recruitment is a critical aspect. And the way it works right now is that we have physicians, uh, we go to them to help recruit patients for a trial. And so we ask them, do you have any patients with a particular disease? They recruit a group of patients, but many of them uh, will drop out or not be interested. And then we collect some of the data. We check that they're taking the medicine that they're trying out and eventually provide an FDA submission from this. And so it's largely driven by physician recruitment as the way it is right now. So what if we change that? So what if we have a, a sponsor who suggests that they want to run a trial? This is, could be Pfizer and we, we want to get some trial data. And so we create the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And, and we use the, excuse me, we use the iPhones to try to find participants. The iPhone has an app that collects some of the patient data. They ask, answer a few questions, oops. And they get a general sense of their fitness based upon perhaps a, a Fitbit or a perhaps the Apple Health application. We know what the weather is. We know what their health is based upon these kinds of data. And we are essentially creating a digital twin. We're getting to know something about this individual as a a digital concept of what data might be available. And we answer different questions. For instance, are they interested in participating in different trials for different diseases? And so the search for 
the search for participants goes through the app to identify digital twin candidates. And then they match two individual human patients and say, would you be interested in participating in a particular trial? If they are verified that their information is correct, they go to a healthcare professional and they collect the data, get more data from the cloud, and eventually go into the FDA approval. So it's a, a change of the process of recruitment using iPhones. And so a, a trial sponsor will create a web application um, to recruit patients. They'll use this particular tool called Glen Twin 360. Um, and the iPhone app will then say, hey, would you be interested in answering some of the questions that we have that would be the eligibility criteria? So do you smoke? Are you between the age of 17 and 28? And do you exercise at least twice a week? And do you have any muscle pain afterwards? And so they answer different questions that might be applicable to that trial or generally to other trials. And if they match the trial criteria, they'll be sent an information about the trial and they can sign up. So I won't give a demo, but a lot of the the tough thing to go on within it is how do you get the right inclusion criteria? There's thousands of trials, and so you don't want to ask people thousands of questions. Can we merge the different inclusion exclusion criteria and put forward a series of interesting questions and rank order those questions for the users? So they only answer a few at a time, perhaps. And every time they do, they provide more information, which might make them a better match for different trials. And so it's this matching criteria, which is something we're still working on with the inclusion exclusion criteria. And here are some questions that they might have to answer that would work against several different trials. And if all the criteria match the inclusion and you're not feeling the exclusion criteria, it's a good candidate. And so a lot of the, the details are going into that ranking process. All right, so I'm about out of time, but I'm going to just talk about some of the challenges that we have in artificial intelligence within our industry. There's a thing called the hierarchy of needs that Maslow put forward in a very different context. But I think for AI, there is a hierarchy of things that we need. And the idea behind this is that we have to have the bottom of the pyramid before we can have the higher layers. So the first thing we need is to have our data organized. We capture a lot of data, but it's not necessarily easy to capture it well and put it into a place that we can find, place that it's uh, very clear and understanding of what it is, the context it fits with the different words that we associated with it. For that wearable sensor project, how do you exactly describe the location of the wrist where a sensor is attached? Um, is it a matter of the person's left-handed or right-handed? which wrist it goes on? Is it on this side or this side? What if it slips? And how do you represent all that data is really challenging. So I think there's a, a lot of challenges there. When AI started first really hitting a lot of the industry, this also became a challenge. And everyone said, oh, we have to move into AI. Everyone was very nervous that we would be left behind. And so when we're worried about falling behind, we make lots of PowerPoint, ideas. The next thing we did was we collaborated with a lot of companies. We evaluated lots of proof of concepts to figure out what other companies could offer and how they would work. It's a lot of work doing the assessments, and there's just a lot of companies to do these things with. So this process is fairly tiring for us right now. But we're, we're now heading to be a, a data science capable company, where we have a lot of people who are interested in what AI can offer, and we have data scientists who can take off the shelf software and apply it in some way to run standard tools like clustering, classification, and even some deep learning models. We're still working towards being a machine learning capable company where if there's something that the, the off the tools don't solve, how can we solve it? How do we find new solutions? I think this is where we are quite weak at this point. And in pharma in general, we are not AI driven companies. We don't have the mindset. We are not making all our decisions using AI. But other companies are doing that. 
Google, even the, the choices in their cafeteria are governed somewhat by AI. The choices of direction and strategy are all quantified and numeric. Uber, uh, the taxi kind of company, uh, again, they can tell you exactly why a particular connection missed. They're not only setting up the next ride using artificial intelligence, but they're setting the ride after that. So the person is in the right place at the right time for the next ride. And we are a long way from being able to that, from that problem, probably because the healthcare and pharma industries are so complex. We also have this challenge of integration. We have lots and lots of data sets and databases thousands of databases for all sorts of things internally. In addition, there's also external ones from different companies, organizations. There's the PubMed, biological databases, genome browsers, and other things that are external. And we don't want to bring them internal. And, and so it becomes a challenge of integrating all this information together. But we're thinking about knowledge graphs and semantic frameworks to be able to capture all these kinds of data things and find them. We also have a skills landscape problem where we have a lot of people with science backgrounds and pharma. We have a good number of people with IT knowledge. We have statisticians, but AI is a very small fraction by any measure. We have 90,000 people at Pfizer and we have 25, 30 or so AI people, uh, not even experts. And so it's a skill set that still needs to be expanded, I believe. And it's difficult to find people who not only have the statistics programming background, but also the science background who can interpret the results and set the right direction. It's a rare skill set. But it's very much needed. Um, we can see changes to the overall industry and changes of problems. And one of those is the scientific method that we've all been using for, for decades. What happens when we have more research than we can consume to make hypotheses. There's more patterns in the data that we can really manage even as a team and more things that we can possibly test. So how do we prioritize what we test? Currently, we have people making these decisions, but can computers and AI help us make better decisions using the data? I mentioned earlier in the context of imaging that the data that's being produced by the experiments is so complicated that well, we now rely on more complex analysis tools such as deep learning for images that to help us make sense of the results. And so I, I see augmentations to the scientific method being leveraged in these cyclic processes and even drugs starting to follow the cycle of, can we have automated computers in the loop that are making predictions at every stage and perhaps driving these processes 24 seven, as opposed to humans. And so it's an interesting opportunity for robotics for decision making. And I'm not sure if our industry is ready for it yet, but I think it's still coming. And again, this idea of from before the same slide, we can render difficult analyses routine and allow researchers to carry out new previously impossible experiments is just an immense opportunity. But it's not just an imaging, it's in the wearable sensors, it's in the analysis of data for clinical trials and many other areas. And so it's this fusion of information and digital twins, it's taking the information from wearable sensors and records and health records, different images and different modalities of data, all the different omics types of things and using it to solve problems that we haven't even thought of yet. Problems of can we predict how well a clinical trial will work? 